that's actually kind of what I'm, I'm talking about here today is um, how do we feed the bees? Because um, we all have, you know, out here we all have yards and um, gardens. Um, so we have this opportunity to really create these great habitats for bees and other pollinators that um, are struggling now with the increased pesticide use and um, other things that have kind of developed. Uh, and so one thing that we've done, started to do that's really exciting is um, we have a research project that is a uh, honey DNA. And essentially what it is is looking at samples of honey and getting an exact breakdown of um, the flowers that created it. So um, actually sequencing the pollen that's in the honey to say, you know, this is pine honey um, and how, what percentage of it is. And we've actually started doing this um, here and in other cities um, around the country and even the world. We actually had one from France. Um, and what this is showing us is exactly what a, a, this hive's diet was like. Um, how many different plants were they getting? What was the primary plants that they were going to? A lot of it has to do with when things are in bloom, but we can learn a lot from looking at these things, such as do the bees that are healthy and, or do, yeah, do the hives that are healthy, are they getting a more varied source of food as opposed to bees that may be near a farm or something and they get, you know, most of the honey is one thing because that's, you know, the monoculture monoculture of the farm had those big spaces where it was only one plant um, as opposed to a varied source of food. Um, so, and we are finding that more diverse food sources appear to be what we're finding in the city. Whereas when we get out there, um, out into the suburbs and rural areas, there's generally less uh, flowers per sample than the ones that we're finding in the city. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the, you know, the open spaces, bees having to travel a long distance to get um, to where they want to be. Uh, and I'm kind of just jumping around these slides. Um, but uh, here are some plants that we're, we're finding that bees do enjoy. Um, these are actually, so we have, uh, you know, some herbs and, and flowering plants up there um, with lavender, sage, cilantro. Um, and then we have some perennials and annuals. Um, so these are some great plants, and we can uh, certainly, if you'd like to follow up with us, send you this image and any of the other slides that you see. Um, so here's some known plants that bees love. So these are great things that you can put in your yard. Um, and so as we're going with this Honey DNA project, we're finding different things coming up. Um, and so here's some plants that we, we suggest for different parts of the year. Um, because the important thing is that bees need to have uh, not only varied food sources, but consistent food sources. So um, whereas in farmlands, you, you find that they have monoculture where there's one thing that's planted at a time, and then that's the only food for two weeks, and then the rest of the year, all that space is not being used for anything, really. Um, so with our gardens, what we have to keep in mind is having things that are in bloom throughout the season, which is great for both the bees and the gardener, because then you don't ever have a period where you know your garden isn't looking good and uh, having things in bloom. So here are a few different examples of things uh, starting in March and, and going through the first half of the year that you can certainly plant. Um, so both some trees, some actual flowering plants, and then um, you know a few other things in there. And again, we can definitely provide you with um, any of the lists or slides you see. Um, and here's stuff for the, the second half of the year. Um, so going through uh, July through October. And uh, so we really think that by planting these green uh, spaces that have a variety of food sources is going to be the best chance for us getting healthy honeybees. Um, and Rest assured that if you put these things in your yard, you will have honeybees coming to your yard. Um, so it's great if you have bees. It's great even if there's just bees in the area, which I can tell you there are definitely honeybees in this area. Um, <laughs> they'll travel up to three to five miles uh, to forage, actually. So um, even the hives that we have in Wellesley are probably visiting all of your yards as well. Um, you may see them from time to time. Um, so this is going through the second half of the year. Um, and then here's uh, some actual plants that uh, we found 
specifically from the honey DNA analysis of top plants that have been uh, popular with the bees. Um, you'll note there's some really great things like uh, uh, apple, aster, uh, chrysanthemum. There's also a few things that gardeners are not fond of. Um, some infamous ones such as dandelions and knotweed. Um, so it goes to show that um, even plants that we like that um, you know, we like a lot of plants that bees also enjoy for foraging from, but they also enjoy a lot of plants that we're not as fond of. Um, dandelions are, of course, a big one. They're a, a huge spring uh, forage for the bees. One of the first things that come up in the spring, as we, we all know, because we are already seeing them and they're um, starting to come to feed. But um, a great food for bees. So, you know, of course, you do want to get them out of your yard because uh, they will spread like crazy. But uh, you know, keep in mind that before they go to seed, they are feeding some bees and some other important pollinators for our ecosystems. Uh, so these are a few illustrations um, with our Honey DNA project. We we send the um, top plants that were in the sample as illustrations to the um, person who sent in the sample. So these are a few that our in-house artist Paige Mulhern did. Um, and so kind of continuing off that idea of uh, plants that bees aren't as, or that we're not as crazy about that bees like, here are uh, a few of the things that, you know, we generally consider to be like weeds and other things, but are actually pretty good for bees. Um, so one thing to consider when you're, you know, if you're managing your yard and uh, your garden space and um, thinking about what to plant, thinking about uh, what do I treat with, um, you know, how you manage everything. Something to keep in mind is that um, if there, if you do have space where you're able to let things kind of take their own course, uh, you know, maybe part of your yard, if it's it's off to the edge, you can kind of just let uh, get a little wild. Um, that's really it works well for the bees if you let things kind of grow in that um, aren't as popular, and if you have a space where it's okay to, you know, you're you're not as worried about. Uh, it then you know you can create a really nice habitat for bees by just letting things that naturally crop up kind of grow um, in a set area um, so here are just a few other things you can do um, so uh, basically um, you know the important thing about uh, the forage for the bees is they're getting their pollen and their nectar from it so um, to kind of go back to what this all does is that they um, Different plants have different properties for bees, so some produce a lot of pollen, some produce a lot of nectar. Um, so those are things to consider when you're planting for bees. Um, I'll actually, if you want, kind of switch over to um, talking more about the beehives themselves. Um, so this, this is what we work with. Uh, we set up a colony of bees in these, and um, there are a number of them that are in Wellesley and the surrounding area uh, with our clients who have bees. Um, so to give, show you a little bit more about it, here are kind of our standard, uh, this is the standard suit. Uh, so this is what we generally wear, keeps us protected from the bees. Uh, and so when we're setting up hives, they're actually, uh, they're really getting started now. This is the big time of year for bees to start. Um, so as you saw, plants like crocus and other things like that that have already come into bloom, they were really important for the bees that were uh, coming out of winter from last year. Um, so when they're first coming out of the hives, they're really hungry for food and spring forage, and, and those are the things that they're going to immediately. So once the temperature warms up above like 40, 50 degrees, that's when the bees become active again. And now we're uh, at the point of the year where we're installing new beehives where um, spring's really coming into bloom, so they're finding a lot more things available. Um, so we'll, we'll set these up, and um, generally we start with with one hive and they expand and grow throughout the season because as we said the bees are a social insect they have a hive um, and a colony that expands and grows throughout the season to accommodate um, you know the different times of year because during the winter they have to cluster together and stay warm and basically survive off the honey they have in the hive to make it through the spring when they can leave the hive again so all summer they're working to collect forage to kind of create almost like a food reserve for themselves for the winter. And that's why honeybees are the popular choice for beekeepers is because they tend to, um, if they're a really strong colony, will produce a surplus of honey more than they need. Um, 
so we generally check our, uh, we'll set up our hives now. We'll generally keep checking them every few weeks. These are the suits we wear, just to give you an idea. Um, they're really comfortable in the middle of summer when it's 98 <laughs> degrees. Um, and these are the uh, the gloves that we use. So they kind of they protect some of our arms, and we generally will have a some sort of hat with a veil over it to protect our, our faces and, and necks and everything. Um, and then here's our smokers. So this is, uh, you may be familiar with smoke actually calms bees down. So when we're servicing a hive, a lot of times we'll uh, use this to blow smoke into it and uh, make it so that it's a lot easier to work with. Honeybees are very docile. They, uh, they're not prone to stinging because if they do sting, unlike wasps and other uh, stinging insects, uh, honeybees will die, so it's a last resort for them. Um, but generally, we'll um, smoke them to kind of make it a little bit easier to work with because it prevents them from uh, going as crazy. Do you, you use specific smoking? Uh, there's, there's a few things you can use. Uh, a lot of times we just use cotton that um, you can buy online or even uh, like paper will work. Um, so really anything. Actually, the, the best thing is... Um, like dried pine needles and other things like that. Um, it ends up having like a really sweet smell and actually seems to almost make a difference with the, how the bees react. <laughs> um, almost, it, it's almost if it's you know, more natural to them. Um, and here's our bee brush. Um, so this is for when working hives, we will use this to brush bees out of the way as we need. Um, and I thought I brought a hive tool, but I, I guess I might not have my hive tool, but um, to show you a bit more about the inside of the hive. Um, so each box has these frames in them. Um, so these are, each one of these has beeswax on it. Um, and essentially this is how they build out their comb. And this is where they store all of that pollen and nectar. And it's also where they lay their eggs to, uh, you know, keep the, the colony going and raise new bees. Um, so we'll start them with a, uh, a blank foundation that's made from beeswax. So this is the, the blank foundation. It's, it's beeswax that's been purified and pressed into a template. And then we give this to kind of set them a, with a road map for how to build. And they'll build it out to be like this, where um, they produce wax from their glands, which they build out and uh, use this to store everything in. Uh, so you can see this is... This is really how they keep the hive organized is by, um, you know, storing their food and their and raising their brood all in the, the same place. Um, generally, there'll be more, they'll have more honey in the top of the hive and nectar and stuff in the top of the hive because they're anticipating that during the winter, that's where they're going to be clustered for warmth and uh, trying to just eat honey but not have to break cluster because they have to stay warm. Um, and then they'll tend to, you know, raise the, the new bees down in the lower um, parts. So throughout the season, we, um, we'll generally start with one box, as I said. Um, in the summer, as they start collecting more um, pollen and nectar, and if the colony's growing in size, we'll generally add a second box. Um, and then they'll just do their own thing, really. Um, it's kind of amazing to see them coming and going because they have um, as many of you know, they have a flight path that they'll just kind of dart out and go exactly where they know the forage is. Because um, when they're, the bees are coming back and finding food, they communicate uh, through the waggle dance, as many of you probably know, uh, where to find that food. Um, so they're coming in and through, you know, a, a few different ways of steps and circles and shaking their butts, they end up communicating that there's, you know, this food, however many miles away in that direction. Um, so it's really pretty amazing um, how they all work together to just try to produce enough food that the colony can sustain itself through the winter. Uh, because they'll actually, the bees that are alive now in the spring and summer aren't going to make it all the way to the winter. So it really is um, all about just keeping that colony going. Um, even though they're working like crazy now to forage as much as they can, uh, the bees in the summer will actually only live about a month or so, but the bees that um, are hot, alive in the winter, which don't go, get to go outside, they actually end up surviving the whole time of the winter, so about three months. So you can see the difference that um, for the bees that don't have to go out and collect food, 
they end up living so much longer because they're they have to spend there's so much less stress with you know going out and carrying uh, pollen and nectar back. So it's it's really pretty amazing. Um, and then here's a an actual honey frame. Um, so you can see when what they do is they bring the nectar back and then um, they put it in the cells. And as you're you may know uh, nectar, it's it's kind of like a watery, sugary um, syrup that uh, they'll actually dehydrate um, so they can help co create evaporation in the cells that will um, reduce the water content to about 18%. And once it gets there, that's when it's considered honey. At that point, um, it actually can't spoil. Um, so honey will last forever without spoiling if it's contained right. And so what the bees do to contain it is once they dehydrate it and get to the right uh, water content, they'll fill up the cell and then uh, cover it with wax. And that's um, then the honey is good to just kind of sit for sit until winter or whenever they want to use it. So um, when we're working hives and and pulling honey, these are what we're we're pulling out and then um, harvesting from that. Um, so um, I'm I'm happy to answer questions now if you'd like to start throwing them at me. Um, I saw you. When we pull honey uh, to harvest, that is taking away from that food store that they're building up. Um, so that's it again goes back to how honeybees tend to produce a surplus to what they need. It's actually uh, pretty incredible the range of um, production a hive can have. So um, some hives will only produce a handful of a few pounds of honey in a season that could be extracted. Some hives will produce over 100 pounds in a single season that's in addition to what they need. Generally, we leave hives with about 60 pounds of honey to make it through the winter. Um, so when we do pull honey frames, we are taking away from their food stores. We do want to make sure that they have enough. Um, and one of the reasons why it actually is good to pull the honey is because if we left the honey, um, they actually produce so much that it would cause them to swarm more frequently. Um, and so what swarming is, is it's when the, we're actually entering swarm season now. It's a way that the bees increase their, uh, you know, or spread their colony to different areas. So it's when one colony essentially becomes two. So a hive will um, create a new queen bee, which will, uh, the old queen will leave with half of the colony to start a new colony elsewhere. Um, and so they do that when they feel very confident that they have you know, a secure home with a lot of food. So um, during this part of the year, we're always making sure that we're giving them enough space so they never feel like uh, they don't have, you know, too much room left because that will prompt them to swarm. And so if we didn't pull honey, then it would kind of um, create a situation where they, they wouldn't have enough, they would end up filling up the space and then swarming um, and swarming again. And it would kind of just become a, a cycle. <laughs> Well, so it's a, it's a um, it's an interesting um, catch twenty two. So as as a beekeeper um, and you know general environmentalist, we we love the idea of bees uh, increasing their populations naturally. The problem is that when the swarms do go out, um, one most people are very intimidated by seeing a, a swarm somewhere. Um, so it becomes a, a public safety. Um, aspect. Even though swarms are very safe, um, they actually won't sting generally during when they're swarming because they don't have a home to protect. Um, so they don't feel any sort of terror. They they really are kind of territorial towards um, any living space that has honey and has um, baby bees. Essentially, that's what w will prompt them to sting. So if they are in a swarm, they don't have either of those. Um, so they, they won't sting. Um, but people become very concerned because they see 10,000 bees on a tree branch and it, I mean, it is, it is pretty crazy to see. So, um, swarming is good for the bees, but, um, uh, one, it's a safety thing. And then, uh, generally when they do find somewhere to set up shop, it's your neighbor's attic. It's, you know, 
<laughs> it's somewhere that someone's generally not happy about having a beehive. <laughs> Yeah, it's um so it's interesting because we we found that um pesticide levels actually stay pretty consistent um regardless of whether you're in a thing or even in a city setting like Boston. So we see there's actually um pretty consistent levels of pesticides and disease um in the hives. Um so it's it's really I think become one of those things where it's almost unavoidable now, um, as people will become more um, treatment free with their lawn or, or be greener with it. Um, I think it certainly helps, but with the colonies foraging up to three or five miles and you know having so many foraging bees, um, they're always gonna be pulling back food that does have pesticides in it. So that's why what we're, we're trying to do is kind of say, given that um, kind of unfortunate reality, how do we move forward and, and still create a situation where uh, the bees can flourish despite those setbacks and disadvantages. Um, and of course, promoting um, you know, the least amount of pesticides possible. Um, I'm certainly not advocating for the, saying that it's, it's great and OK, but it, you know, it is reality is that people have to take care of their lawns, and people are always going to use pesticides. Um, some, some people will. Um, so that's kind of the situation we're in. Sure. So uh, bumblebees are they're they're definitely um, they have a lot of overlap with honeybees in terms of forage. Um, they do. There are some things that bumblebees can't get food from that um, honeybees can, and vice versa. Uh, but they do forage on a lot of things. There's actually it's kind of interesting um, the difference in how they forage because with a bumblebee they kind of use their mass to just bump into um, plants and uh, get you know they end up getting pollen just kind of coated on them inadvertently. Whereas with honeybees, they're actually, you know, collecting the pollen and putting it in their um, pollen sacks on their legs. And they just have, it's interesting with their bio or anatomy, how they can do different sort of different plants. Um, but bumblebees are, are similarly, um, you know, facing difficulties with um, the pesticides and, and diseases. Um, they're, I think they're maybe not, studied as uh, closely since they don't have the um, like agricultural interests that honeybees do with beekeeping being like a trade. Um, but honeybees are, or bumblebees are a solitary bee, so they're not like honeybees that, which um, have a colony and will produce, you know, honey to store. Um, bumblebees are solitary, so they'll kind of, they'll create nests to, um, you know, reproduce, but after that they're kind of just out on their own looking to create a new nest with a new mate and just uh, looking to just feed themselves rather than create a you know, big reserve of food. Um, and there's, there's a few other, I mean there's many, many types of bees. Um, of course other common ones that people see are uh, carpenter bees, which uh, look a lot like bumblebees but are um, less desirable since they tend to burrow in our, our homes, whereas the bumblebees are a little bit less invasive. So um, there, there's so many different kinds um, of different solitary bees and even stingless bees. Um, yeah, and it, it varies from place to place um, for sure. Yep, so we, um, we install our hives from uh, packages of honeybees. So um, in Georgia and down south, um, apiaries will, will produce bee packages because the client is, or the climate is more friendly towards honeybees. So you're able to um, really be able to produce and take care of bees year round without as much uh, winter die off. Um, so they, we get our bees from, from Georgia as many um, hobbyists and commercial beekeepers do. Um, and essentially what they, they come up in almost like a shoebox size package that um, is just a wooden package with, with vents on the side. Uh, they have a can of sugar water in there to, to help them make the journey and um, a queen bee which is actually in a cage because she's not biologically that um, colony's queen uh, the way that 
bees are kind of produces, they don't end up being able to line, you know, it's not that they take a colony and just put it in a box. They rear the queen separately and kind of pair them up that way. Um, but they, be, as they make the trip, they become adjusted to her pheromones and um, accept her as their queen and become a colony from there. So it's, it's kind of interesting. But we do, um, this is the time of year where we're installing them. We're actually, um, tomorrow night, I'll be helping unload the final shipment of bees that comes up from Georgia that has um, about 300 packages on it. And each one of those packages has 10,000 worker bees in it. So it's like a, roughly 3 million bees, um, you know, give or take a few hundreds of thousands. Um, so those will be coming up tomorrow night and we'll um, load them off the truck and, and then just pop them into hives as quickly as we can uh, to get them out and, and foraging. Yeah, I, I don't have um, a list specifically for, for native plants, um, although I'm, I'm sure that um, information is out there. Um, it would be definitely good to have to, because native plants are obviously the best for, for the area. And yeah, and a lot of times those are what the bees um, really love because they're, that's, you know, those are the things that they evolved with. Um, those are the plants that were available. Sure, yeah, so um, raw honey is, is something that is definitely, um, well, you'll notice that it's more expensive, so it is valued. Um, <laughs> and essentially what it is is uh, a lot of the honey that we're kind of used to classically is, um, you know, the golden bear and everything. Um, it's, it's been pasteurized, so what they do is heat it up to um, just make it so that it, it'll never crystallize and it kind of stays in that, that liquid form um, for its entire life. Um, but what happens when they do the pasteurization is they cook out a lot of the good natural enzymes and other things that are, um, are just in the, the honey because, I mean, it, it's literally just nectar that's from plants. So there's a lot of great different things in there that we don't get in our diets because we don't eat dandelions and pine trees and stuff like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, you get a lot of different things in there and that's why, uh, you know, beekeepers will always say that raw honey is better because it has more flavor. Um, it'll have those nutrients. And um, fortunately, it's definitely become more uh, accessible with the increase of beekeeping kind of in popularity uh, in urban settings over the past few years. There's definitely a lot more raw honey available. And you'll notice that it, it doesn't always look like that liquid golden bear honey cause, because what will happen naturally with honey is that it will crystallize, which is... Um, when the sugars will actually become almost like a solid so that um, you end up with something more of like a um, frosting-y, crystal-y texture. Um, and it's actually really good. It, a lot of beekeepers prefer it because, one, it's a sign that it's raw honey uh, because pasteurized honey won't do that. And as well because it's, it's not as, you know, drippy and you, you can work with it a lot better. And it's got a different texture. Um, so I actually have um, some raw honey with me. I don't know where I'll be able to give out any tasting so I know there's another talk right after this but um, if you're interested you know happy to talk more and, and give out some taste of raw honey to anyone who's interested uh, yes so um, the mason bee is another type of solitary bee um, and essentially what they do is um, they don't they generally don't uh, create the holes themselves but they um, will actually burrow in, in small, um, almost like pipe like holes in buildings and wood and other, um, any sort of sit setting actually. There's actually, I saw a video online once of um, a mason bee pulling a screw out of a like brick wall to, um, which was really amazing because the screw is much larger than the bee, but it, and you know, it's clearly loose, but it managed to pull this thing out to make its, its nest inside of. Um, it's so a really kind of amazing feat of insect strength there. But um, it's, it's another type of solitary bee. Um, again, a pollinator, an important pollinator, and one that um, we can actually foster in our, our gardens through um, providing habitat for. You can um, now buy bee hotels, which will um, kind of 
provide suitable nesting um, settings for both mason bees, bumblebees, and all sorts of pollinators. So it's a really great thing that are popping up in, you know, like True Values and, and just places like that, um, and something that are great to, because they, they help those other pollinators that, um, you know, we aren't setting up beehives for, whereas with the honeybees, we're, we're invested in having honeybees, so, and, you know, it's an industry, so traditionally people have set up hives, but with those other pollinators, they don't get the same um, attention. <laughs>Uh, yes, so um, our, our service is, um, it's full service beekeeping, um, so we install and maintain the hives on our client sites, um, and it's per calendar year, so you sign up for the year, and then um, every winter it, it renews for the next season, um, and essentially we provide everything, the equipment, the bees, and the maintenance, generally coming um, on average like once every four weeks to service the hive, um, all the honey go produced in the hive goes to the clients, um, and then it helps us with our research. So we have a, an application on our phone that we use to track every hive's information, every visit, um, and then we use that with our research to say, all right, with these hives, you know, we saw that they had this disease, and we did this, and, um, and things like that. It's, it's really great for, um, you know, we look at hives that made it through the winter, and we have a lot of, a really huge amount of information to work with. Um, for our lab. Um, so it's not too late. Uh, we, we are setting up hives in our own apiaries, so we'll be installing them throughout the next month um, until we eventually run out. Um, but yeah, feel free to come up and talk more. Um, yeah, that's a good uh, uh, so for, um, for this area, it's uh, just about $1,000 per year per hive, uh, so including the maintenance, the equipment, and the bees. Um, Pretty much all inclusive. It's a one uh, once annual fee, and then you're you're good to go. But thank you. Um, I, I it's I'm not sure if that's um for for honeybees or. Well, any kind, whatever comes to my yard, I welcome. Yeah. Um, well, there are um, a lot of bees that will um, make nests in the ground. Um, some are, you know, bees that were not as crazy, but I think some sorts of hornets may or, or wasps may. But um, there's other pollinators that will burrow in the ground. So I think having uh, the ground be a bit looser does make that, I would think, easier for them. Um, so you loosen it up rather than leave it alone um, in a flower bed? I'm not really sure. I, <laughs> to be honest, I. I can't really speak to, um, you know, ground nests as much. Sure. Uh, so this, we actually have been traditionally, um, we were a treatment-free um, company, so we weren't using chemical treatments with our hives or any sorts of um, treatment, and instead trying to do uh, treatment-free methods of, you know, uh, removing drone brood, um, you know, breaking the brood cycle and things like that. Um, when it seemed necessary. And we, we were rearing queens as well from survivor hives in hopes that um, that would kind of help create a stock of um, queens that would be good, like um, the work of Marla Spivak. Um, but now we, we've started using treatment um, as a lot of the other, um, or a lot of the like Marla Spivak, Spivak sort of um, beekeepers have started to rear queens in conjunction with treatments. Um, this year we did oxalic acid on the, the hives um, before installing them so that without the brood there was, um, I mean there was no worry about the brood or anything, so just getting them treated before in the hive. Um, and then we're, we're uh, I think maybe going to be doing the, the strips later in the year. Um, yeah. It's, it's, uh, you generally do it uh, going into the fall because uh, that's when the varroa populations really start ramping up. So um, I think generally late summer to fall is when uh, we will be putting strips in. Um, it's it's a new thing for us too, um, you know, because we we wanted to be treatment free. Yeah, of and course. that's like the goal. But then yeah, the yeah, and it it goes back to the you know almost like pesticide debate. So there's there's always going to be some degree of compromise that you know, we'll have to be met there, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it's great speaking with you. Feel free to come up and find me wherever I end up and uh, talk more. Thank you, Sean. <laughs>